Amen. Let me encourage you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. As odd as it may sound, we will not start with Ephesians chapter 6 this morning. But as you're turning there, let me remind you of what Proverbs 4.23 says. Proverbs 4.23 says this, Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of life. Let me read it again. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Before we go any further this morning, I need you to understand that our strategy is to protect our hearts from a real and present danger. That we as Christians seek to protect our heart from what the Bible calls in Ephesians 6, the methods of the devil, the fiery darts of the enemy of souls. And so as we approach the belt and the breastplate this morning, let's do so with a clear understanding that these things are necessary if we are to stand in this battle. In verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 6, it says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And then our text for this morning. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. One of the most damaging things to our self-esteem is when our belt breaks. Has that ever happened to you? It happened to me just a couple of months ago. I was here at the office getting ready Sunday morning, and I went to, you know, and then I, put, I was putting my belt, and it just broke. Like, it literally just broke. Even for a man of my muscular... Um, <laughs> Physique that can hurt your self esteem a little bit. You're, you're putting the belt on and it literally just breaks. Now, I had two choices in that moment. I could either stand up in front of you without a belt and pray that gravity ceases to exist. <laughs> and somehow, spiritually, my pants would stay up. Or I might run the risk of just, if I stood right behind the pulpit, nobody might even notice. My second option was to take out my cell phone and make a real awkward call to my lovely wife. (laughs) And I said, I don't know if I texted it or called, I said, "Uh, my belt broke. And I was expecting a laugh. To her credit, she did not laugh. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Why wear a belt? Well, we wear a belt, those of us who wear a belt, to keep our pants up. Deep, right? (laughs) We wear a belt in order to keep everything where it's supposed to be so that it doesn't end up where it's not supposed to be. This morning, we're going to talk about the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. Can I suggest to you that the two or two of the main things that the world runs away from is truth and righteousness. I mean, we hear things like this all the time. Ignorance is bliss. Have you ever heard that before? Ignorance is bliss. To which I respond, if ignorance is bliss, why aren't more people happy? (laughs) Right? We're told that the lack of knowledge actually is better for us, and that is a lie. It is a method or a scheme of the devil. And another thing that the world seems to run away from is this idea of righteousness. 
We, we seem to be told and to think that the way to true happiness, the way to true security is to just do whatever we feel like doing, whatever comes into our minds or into our hearts. And this morning we will see that one of the easiest way to fail in watching over our hearts with all diligence is a willful ignorance and a willing unrighteousness. And Paul tells us that if we are to stand, if we are to finish our life and be able to say to God, I, I did my best, and say to others, I've finished my course, I've run my race, I have kept the faith, we must be purposeful in truth and in righteousness. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we have so often neglected the belt of truth, not only in how we handle other people, but how we handle ourselves. We've lied to ourselves. We've preached to ourselves an error-filled false message. And so, Lord, I pray that this morning, by your Holy Spirit, through means of the Word of God, that you would stir within us a delight in truth, a pleasure in truth. And more than that, Lord, that you would stir within us a commitment to telling ourselves the truth as a means of defense against the enemy of souls. And Lord, I pray that you would stir within us a delight in righteousness that we would not see Christianity or the things commanded in the New Testament as burdens on our back, but delights in our heart. Not only to glorify you, as wonderful as that is, but also as a defense from the schemes of the devil. Lord, he wants to lie to us, we know, and he wants to oppress us by our own guilty conscience. So, Lord, would you stir us to put on the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. And, Lord, if there's someone here today who does not yet know you as Lord and Savior, would you draw them to yourself this morning? Would you show them the truth would you show them their absolute lack of righteousness? Would you show them their need, not for a reformed life, but a need for a redeemer? We ask this to the praise of your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As we mentioned a second ago, I think the two things... What? Who did this? <laughs> now, that's one intimidating person. Can you, can you at least give me that? You don't want to bump up against that guy in a dark alley. Yeah. <clears throat> what does the world resist most about the life we're trying to lead is probably truth and righteousness. And if you don't believe me, tell the truth and see how people respond. Go out of these walls where it's not safe, where it doesn't feel safe, and tell people that unless they receive the Lord, their expectation is eternal judgment, and see how graciously they respond to truth. It's the same way we responded to it until the Lord changed our hearts. And the other thing that they respond negatively to is righteousness. If you don't believe me, try it. Pursue and expect righteousness and see how people respond. The second thing we need to understand is the need for truth and righteousness. And as will become clear and apparent, the lack of these two things opens us up to Satan's attacks. Again, the armor of God is meant to protect us from an enemy. It is a defensive weapon. 
And we'll see this morning that one of, or two of the main ways the devil tries to trip us up is by reminding us how sinful we are and lying to us. We have a responsibility to be defensive towards the attacks, the methods, the schemes of the devil. And if we don't, it's kind of our fault when we fall into them, right? I mean, let me ask you this. If you don't lock your doors and somebody robs you, isn't it a little bit your fault? If you leave your cell phone on the table at a restaurant and go to the bathroom and when you come back, it's gone, isn't it a little bit your fault? Shouldn't you have taken it with you? Shouldn't you have locked your doors? If your pants fall down in public, isn't it a little bit your fault? Because you didn't put on your belt. Right? Christians, my beloved friends, we suffer so much failure in this life. Isn't it a little bit our fault? Isn't it a little bit due to how negligent we are to tell ourselves the truth and to practice righteousness? Isn't it a little bit because we are so hesitant to employ the resources God gives us to live well? Look at verse 13. It says this, Therefore take up the full armor of God. Why? So that you will be able to resist in the evil day. Now, what does that mean? We talked about it last week. We take the armor of God so that we will be able to resist. If we don't, we won't. And then it says this, and having done everything to stand firm. We take up the full armor of God so that we would be able to stand. And we take up the full armor of God so that having done everything we can, we will stand. So let's start this morning with the command to stand. In verse 14, the first three words we see are this, stand firm, therefore. This is a command. God does not offer us this. He doesn't say, you know what, I'm going to come, I'm going to save you, and then you decide later whether or not you're going to live this life or whether or not you're going to strive for righteousness or whether or not you're going to walk in the Spirit. That is not an option to us. We are commanded to do that. The call of Christ is a command to stand. And if you don't, if you won't, when you fall into gross sin, into subtle sin, into any sin, it's a little bit your fault. So what we can't say is this, well, the devil made me do it. No, we had the defense. The question is, are we going to use it? I want to make sure I mention this, too, before we go any further. If you are an unbeliever in the room or watching online right now, most of what I will be talking about this morning does not apply to you. Ephesians 6 was written to believers to show believers how to fight the onslaught of the enemy of souls. Your first order of business, my unbelieving friend, is to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. It would be foolish to ask you to fight a battle you are not equipped to fight. And in fact, pursuing truth apart from Jesus and pursuing righteousness apart from Jesus may just make you a very arrogant unbeliever. Because you don't go to heaven for being smart, and you don't go to heaven for being holy, because none of us are smart, and none of us are holy. And so if you're an unbeliever this morning, we're glad you're here. We praise God that you're here. But the question you must ask yourself over and over again is not, how do I stand against the onslaught of the devil? You need to ask yourself, who is Jesus? And am I right with him? And then we'll get to this stuff. But for believers, 
there is a command to stand. And first of all, the armor of God is a call to dependence. Notice what we find in verse 10 again. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. That is to say that God's strength is a resource available to us, believers. And our life then is a life of dependence on him. But it's not just that. The armor of God is also a call to decisiveness. God, through Paul, is commanding, in verse 14, that we stand. And then he commands us how we do it, how we stand, what we are to do in order to stand. Why is this important? Because standing strong doesn't simply mean standing still. And sometimes we hear things like, well, just let go and and let God. As if the Christian life does not require any energy, any effort. And if we do that, and we forget that we are called to, to, to do, we do so to our peril, because that itself is one of the schemes of the devil. So with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about the belt of truth. In verse 14, it says this, stand firm, therefore, and then it has a very awkward phrase. It's awkward in English, and it's awkward in Greek, and it's really hard to translate. That's why almost every translation translates it differently. What it literally says In verse 14 is this, Therefore stand, having put around your waist truth, or having girded yourself or belted yourself in truth. Well, that's not an expression that really jumps out to us. And even this word, this word for waist, could also be translated loins, which is not a word we use very often. So how is this phrase translated? In the ESV, it's translated, having fastened the belt of truth. In the NASB 95, which I'm reading this morning, it it says, girding your loins. Okay, honestly, how many of you have used the expression, girded your loins, in the last couple weeks? Here's your homework. Use it this week. Your kids come out. You say, did you gird your loins? And they'd look at you and they'd go, uh, uh, I'm not sure. (laughs) I think I did. Your husband walks by you and you say, did you gird your loins? (laughs) Well, if he's here, he'll know yes. Basically, what it really came down to was one of two things. In Jewish culture and Old Testament culture, they, they would always wear like long flowing garments right? And they would have a belt, but then when they were getting ready to run or to battle or to do anything, they'd reach down and they'd pull up the bottom and pull it through and tuck it in their belt. Just for a couple of reasons, not least of which is then they won't trip on their garments as they were running to or fro. Now, the Romans, they actually had what they, what some call a girdle, which is not something I wear very often, But it was basically a belt, but it had strips of leather in the front with metal pieces on it. And that belt would attach the rest of the armor to them. And so if they didn't have that belt, their armor would not be secure on them. I think that's the picture here, is we start with truth. It keeps everything where it needs to be, like a belt. I remember years ago, a lot of the guys... I worked at a car wash, and a lot of the guys wore their pants down here. But they wore a belt to keep it there. And I was like, what? Why? What? I remember one of the guys I used to always say, hey, your underwear is showing. And he goes, yeah, Dom, that's, that's, that's the style. Never understood that. Others wear our belts like up here. 
You decide which is worse. (laughs) The point is, either way, the belt keeps the pants where they need it to be or want it to be. Truth does the same thing with us. Without truth, everything else in the Christian life is off the rails. Without truth, everything else in the Christian life is out of proportion. This belt is probably the Roman thing that had the the leather strips and they would attach everything. And the idea here is preparedness, preparation, being ready. In fact, 1 Peter 1.13 tells us to gird up the loins of our mind, which is obviously metaphorical. But it's this idea that we have to be ready. Well, how can you be ready to confront error when you don't know the truth? How can you be ready to confront error in here, in here, or in the world when you don't know what's true? In fact, It could be argued that one of the main strategies of American evangelicalism over the last 50 years has been to discount truth to such a level that everybody thinks we're all the same. We're not. How does this armor function? It keeps everything else in the right place. It keeps everything else functioning properly. So let's ask this question. How does truth protect us? I'll give you four ways. First of all, thinking rightly about doctrine protects us from falling into error. And if you're writing notes, write the word duh right by that, right? (laughs) Simply, if we don't think what's right, we will think what's wrong. If you don't know what's right, how could you possibly know what's wrong? Would you turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2, a little bit to the right? 2 Timothy chapter 2. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, We'll start in verse 24. It's a passage I go to all the time. 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 24, where it says this, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome. Let's stop there for a second. When I was a younger pastor, I loved the arguments. I loved it. I loved making people feel stupid about my favorite doctrines because I was young and I was stupid. It took me a long time to really grapple with this truth that we're not here to argue with each other. It says this, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to all, able to teach, not just contradict, to teach, patient when wronged with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition. Why? Because truth matters. And I'll show you why in the text. If perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth and they may come to their senses, and notice this, and escape from the snare of the devil having been held captive by him to do his will. You see Paul's point here? Ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance is oppression. Ignorance is not freedom. It's slavery. And we must tell ourselves and tell each other the truth to lead us out of the snares of the devil. Quick plug, Wednesday night's men's Bible study. We've been studying systematic theology, and I know that sounds exciting to you, but it is. 
Last Wednesday, we talked about what it means to be genuinely human. Let me encourage you, men, to be there. 6.30, Wednesday night, right here in this room. Because we're talking about some amazing things. Great discussion. But it's not academic. We're teaching each other. We're sharing truth with each other because that's how we lead each other out of the dangerous place of Satan's deception. Convincing you of error is a common method of Satan to discourage you and lead you astray. Secondly, thinking rightly about our circumstances protects us from being crippled with fear. Sometimes we struggle not with what is true, but with what may be true. And what may be true is not true, at least not yet. crippling you with the fear of the future is a common method of Satan to discourage you and lead you astray. So what do you do, guys? What do you do, beloved? You talk to yourself. You talk to yourself. You wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and you tell yourself the truth go, what about this? Or what about that? What if this happens? What if that happens? What if I am in this situation? What am I in that situation? You tell yourself God is in control and he loves you and Jesus died for you. You fight your fear with faith. So we think rightly about doctrine. We think rightly about circumstances. And next way that truth protects us is When we think rightly about ourselves, it protects us from pride and self-loathing. Could you turn a little bit to the left to Romans chapter 12? Romans chapter 12. Friends, I think one of the most common areas where we lie to ourselves is about ourselves. We tell ourselves we are better than we are because we want to feel good about ourselves. Romans 12, 3 says this, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. It's as if Paul is saying, don't stand in front of the mirror and flex because if you do, your belt's going to break. You will be humbled. Sometimes we want to tell ourselves we're better than we are because we want to feel good. The truth protects us from that pride. I mean, I think it's self-evident that culturally speaking, people are told, trained, to think they are better looking than they are. Hence, yoga pants, right? Am I lying? You're like, you need a belt of truth. Used to be spandex back in the day. People on bikes and we'd be like, oh, sweet mercy, no, please. (laughs) A little bit to the left in Romans 8, 6. The truth protects us from puffing ourselves up. It also protects us from tearing ourselves down. It says this, Romans 8, 6, for the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. That is to say, if we think about the right things, we won't hate ourselves. 
Romans 8, 16 says something similar. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we're children of God. And if children, then heirs. So tell ourselves the truth that we are his, that we belong to him. So how does truth protect us? First of all, right doctrine protects us from error. Two, right, thinking rightly about our circumstances protects us from fear. Three, thinking rightly about ourselves protects us from pride and self-loathing. And four, thinking rightly about God protects us from many serious errors, like idolatry or frivolity. If we think rightly about God, we will not be flippant about him. We'll be reverent. The next part of the armor of God that we'll see is the breastplate of righteousness. What is this breastplate? Well, there's really two possibilities in Roman armor. Either you had a, a solid piece of metal that you would wear in the front so that if something came at you, it would bounce off, or you would have like chain mail kind of that would protect from arrows and things like that. But either way, it was worn right here to protect your heart and to protect your, your vital organs. The idea was to put something there that, that could not be penetrated. And notice then what we see here. Paul says this in Ephesians 6. He says, put on the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. That is to say, we protect ourselves with righteousness, with godliness. So let's ask this question. What kind of righteousness is referred to here? Is this Jesus' righteousness that is given to us when we believe? Well, no, because we don't have to stand, like we don't have to employ that. That's given to us. What's referred here is practical righteousness. And what Paul is saying here is that as we live a life that honors God, we also protect our own hearts. How? How does living a righteous life protect our own hearts? First of all, we assure our hearts that we are genuinely saved through righteousness. Or to put it negatively, when we refuse to obey, does not the devil whisper, whisper in our ears, you're not really his? But when we obey, when we obey willingly and joyfully, we're protected from that. Second Peter 1, 10 through 11 says this, therefore, having been, or, sorry, therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, which the rest of the verse was all righteousness, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly applied to you. We assure our hearts that we're genuinely saved when we obey. Secondly, we avoid the things that wage war against our souls when we practice righteousness. If we're sincere... 1 Peter 2.11 says this, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Unrighteousness, disobedience is an attack on our souls. And thirdly, righteousness preserves our conscience. A guilty conscience is fertile ground for the assaults of the enemy. Isn't it? Isn't it the worst? When you know you're doing what you shouldn't do, when you know you're thinking what you shouldn't think, when you know you're feeling what you shouldn't feel, does the devil ever comfort you? No. He says, you know what? You're a fake. He says, you know what? You don't love Jesus the way you say you do. He says, you know what? You're probably not his. We obey not only 
to assure ourselves. We obey not only to have a, a good conscience, but that is one of the main reasons why. To glorify God with a clear conscience. 2 Corinthians 1.12 says this, For our proud confidence is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we've conducted ourselves in the world, and especially toward you. So how can we apply all this? Well, last week I came up with an acrostic, a memory device that cursed my favorite football team. <laughs> so as an act of penance, I'll give you two more, non-Eagles related. First of all, belt. If we are to benefit from the truth, we must believe the truth. You can't believe what you don't know, and you can't know what you don't learn, and you can't learn what you haven't studied. So let me challenge you to be people of the truth. Read the Bible not out of cold-hearted academic interest. Read the Bible as a defense for your souls, right? as an act of defiance against the devil and his methods. Read the word of God. Study it. Learn it. But don't just learn it. Don't just study it. Don't just believe it. Employ it. Put it to good use. When in your heart, the devil says, you are a sinner. Answer back in your heart you're right but jesus died for me right use the truth to protect your heart and to gird up your loins i am a sinner jesus said he loved me he died for me anyway i am inconsistent but jesus loves me anyway thirdly live the truth See, some of us love to study, but we stop there. We don't do battle in our minds, using the truth to protect our hearts. And some of us stop short of actually putting these things into practice. God says, pray, so pray. God says he'll hear us, so pray. God tells us to obey, then obey, live the truth. Fourthly, trust the truth. When you want to give up, don't. Tell yourself the truth. Martin Lloyd-Jones said it this way. He said, we spend too much time listening to ourselves instead of preaching to ourselves. So preach to yourself. Charles Spurgeon said this. Truth must enter into the soul. It must penetrate and saturate it, or else it is of no value. Doctrines held as a matter of creed are like bread in the hand, which provides no nourishment to the body. But doctrine accepted by the heart is like food digested, which by assimilation sustains and builds up the body. First thing, belt. Secondly, plate. I was going to do breastplate, but there's just too many, too many letters. First of all, when it comes to righteousness, pursue righteousness. What does that mean? That means don't be content just to talk about these things. Seek a life that's genuinely, consistently righteous. Let's do these things. Secondly, love righteousness. One of the worst things a Christian can say, or even worse, what a Christian can feel, is, I have to do this. The Bible tells me to do it. Isn't that the worst? As if Christianity is a grudgery, a drudgery, grudgingly carried out? No, it's the best. What God commands, 
What God commends is the best. Love it. Thirdly, ask for righteousness. Go to him and say, God, would you fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I would love and approve the things you love and approve? Would you grant me a right heart, a right mind so I could be righteous? Not in a saving sense, in a practical sense. Fourthly, train yourself in righteousness. God's not done with us. Some of these things take practice. So do it. And lastly, encourage righteousness. What do I mean by this? I mean that we as a church... Our expectation of one another should be that we are obeying Christ. Our expectation of one another should be that we are pursuing Christ. If our standards get too low, it doesn't affect the world. It affects us. We should expect that we're reading the Bible regularly. We should expect that we're praying regularly. We should expect that we're doing we're fighting against our sinfulness regularly and that we want to. We should expect from one another that church is not just an hour and a half on Sunday morning. It's our life. We should expect that because if we don't, it won't be. We should encourage righteousness in each other. And in ourselves. Okay, real quick before we go. A final exhortation to the unbelievers in our midst. If you are not yet a believer, you must do three things. One, you must receive the truth. The truth is you're not okay. The truth is you're not fine. The truth is you are in your unbelief, under the wrath of an eternal God. You must receive that. And you must recognize that Jesus died on the cross to deliver you from that. And so the second thing you have to do is you must recognize your utter lack of righteousness. The Bible says that our righteous deeds are as filthy rags in his eyes. We don't come to God saying, I'm good, but you're better. We come to God saying, you are good and I am not. If you're an unbeliever this morning, repent. Recognize your lack of righteousness and come to him. He is loving. He will accept you. He promises. So the third thing you must do is come to the Lord and submit to him. Isaiah 55, 1 through 3 says this, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and drink milk without money, without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread? And your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me. And eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me, God says. Listen that you may live, God says. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercies shown to David. John Newton says this, getting back to believers. Though sin remains, it shall not have dominion over us. Though it wars in us, it shall not prevail against us. We have a mercy seat sprinkled with blood. We have an advocate with the Father. We are called to this warfare, and we fight under the eye of the captain of our salvation, who is always near to renew our strength, to heal our wounds, and to cover our heads in the heat of battle. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, the enemy of souls lies to us and we lie to ourselves. Would you help us? Would you train us to love your truth? And Lord, we are so slow to obey. We are so stubborn in our disobedience. We forfeit a good conscience and open ourselves up to the onslaught of the enemy of souls. 
Would you stir us to live in such a way that not only are we protected, but that you're glorified? Not only are we made to feel more secure, but that you are more celebrated. And Lord, if there's someone here this morning for whom now is the time, would you help them? Would you draw them? Would you grant them life so that they would cry out something like this? God, I know I'm a sinner. I, I don't pretend to be better than I am. But if you will save me, if you will change me, if you will, be del- if you will deliver me, nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to your cross I cling. Lord, would you grant someone life? For the rest of us, would you encourage us so that we're not too battle-weary to go forward? To the praise of your glory, in Jesus' name.